So, by the time I have released this video, I assume everyone who watched my Crimes and Punishments review has either gone and played the game, or at the very least, watched a playthrough. If you haven't, that's... okay, but you are missing out. Plus, this video contains spoilers. It won't reveal the outcomes of every case, just the relevant ones that support my argument. This video will discuss the overarching story in the background, and other details I didn't mention in my review. First, let me differentiate between the overarching plot and the cases. The latter are self-contained stories that don't intersect with each other, so their quality varies. They all stand out independently, even those based on existing Holmes mysteries. They even reference previous games. Ah, I see what you're getting at, Holmes. You asked me that once before. On the Ripper case, I believe. These trees, with their roots in water, must originate from Louisiana. Ah, yes, the bayou. I remember our visit in the case of The Awakened. Frogwares wasn't just creating a series of games, but their own Sherlock Holmes universe, which later games would reboot. The overarching plot is an entirely different matter. To summarize, a few cases allude to a group called the Merry Men, revolutionaries who want to destroy the current government, believing it would allow the lower class to gain power. For those powers that be had done their best to plant the fear inside our souls, and we accepted it so easily. The fear advised us to keep our heads bowed. It prevented us from fighting. Bankers and politicians. They own our lives, our work, our bread, and they push us to compete between each other just to see who may serve them better. But in the end, they are the few, so they are weak. They are nothing without their titles. We should not fear them. Our so-called masters should fear us instead. Holmes is approached multiple times by Mycroft and Lestrade to take up cases tied to the group, which account for murder, thievery, and eventually attempted arson. Each time, Holmes turns them down. Sherlock, do please think about it. They are planning something diabolical. Your country needs you. You need me, Mycroft, and you are not the country. Although if your waistline expands very much further... I'm not interested in politics, Lestrade. I'll keep it then. The game plays out as usual, not bringing up the Merry Men. But then, by the sixth case, disaster strikes. Wiggins, leader of the Baker Street Irregulars, comes to Holmes seeking aid for his brother Leighton. Mr. Holmes, is my brother Leighton. He's in a prison cell. They say he's killed two men. You have to help us, Mr. Holmes, because I know he didn't do it. While conducting the investigation, Holmes discovers a circus leader named Foley was doing business with the victim, Kenneth Butler, in exchange for the Hellenistic treasures. Foley's accomplice, Brian Bricotti, was the one who fired the killing blow, but both he and Butler ended up killing each other, and Foley escaped. So, technically, while he was engaging in illegal doings, he isn't guilty of murder. Charles Foley, you were a witness to a double murder. You were standing next to Vercotti when Butler fired at your accomplice. The jeweler missed him, but they proceeded to kill each other with simultaneous shots. Even if your intention was to retrieve the stolen treasure, you did not intend to kill. I shall inform Inspector Lestrade of that fact, so your sentence should be the lighter. Foley's crimes extend further, however. He has been working with the Merry Men, smuggling in gunpowder. The Merry Men intend to blow up the London Stock Exchange and all its documentation, hoping it will free the people from corporate overlords and take control of their lives. We are going to blow up the London Stock Exchange. No lives shall be lost, but ownerships, debts, and property titles? They shall all be destroyed. They're only papers, after all. So many people will be freed over this night. This is all misguided rhetoric from people who say they don't want to compete with their fellow men, but for individuals to come into their own, they must compete to some degree. This applies to all classes, for there is a lot that they can compete over whether against each other or natural forces. Contracts and paperwork can be unfair, but can also ensure healthy competition. Those who outcompete others can become part of the few, recruiting more of the many. Destroying the stock exchange will worsen things, 
with everyone, rich or poor, fighting over properties and possessions no longer secured by documentation. Yet, after all of this, after thwarting the Merry Men, Holmes insists to Mycroft that the Merry Men aren't his concern. Sherlock, the Merry Men are to be stopped. Not by me. You created the Merry Men. Stop them yourself. Only make sure that you don't create ten more Merry Men by arresting the one. I can guess what Frogwares was trying to do. This iteration of Holmes only takes cases he believes will interest him, those with a twist to them, or that spark his analytical creativity. Sure, terrorists hijacking a ship may not be fun, but a murderer without a visible weapon is ten times better. At least to Holmes. I'm not interested in politics, Lestrade. I'll keep it then. Here's another one that's a bit more complex and maybe to your liking. It's a murder, but we're unable to find any weapon. We haven't touched anything. It's at the Roman Baths in Strand Lane. A murder, a vanishing weapon, the Roman Baths. That's for us. Watson, fetch your hat. It's a classic trope. It doesn't affect me, so it doesn't concern me. At least, until it does, when Wiggins's brother gets framed for a murder, and Holmes finds himself at odds with the Merry Men by Foley's association. It's supposed to be a forewarning to Holmes that he will eventually be next if he doesn't take action against those who seek to harm others. Of course, this setup fails, for a few reasons. One of them is that the Merry Men don't feel like a significant threat. Mostly, this is because we don't see the effects of their terrorism. Besides a few brief mentions of their activities, the player doesn't observe how these events damage England. That leads to the second problem. The Merry Men don't have much of a presence. It's great that the cases stand apart, but the Merry Men aren't involved very much. The little reminders don't count since the Merry Men don't influence anything beyond those. Even Lestrade is like, don't want to take on terrorists terrorizing us Tories? Alright then. And third, Holmes's dismissal of the Merry Men is… out of character. He's helped the British government and the aristocracy quite a few times. Holmes keeps his business afloat by taking on cases from the wealthy, and lives in a pretty luxurious flat. The premise of Sherlock Holmes' nemesis was to stop a French thief from ruining England's reputation. He even helped the French government, which awarded him the Legion of Honor that Watson had to sell. The fact that Holmes kept it meant the case was a big deal to him. Yeah, Holmes has his famous line where he says, And I'd rather play tricks with the Lord than with my own conscience. And sure, he's known to let specific perpetrators go, but not because he's the champion of the people. Holmes is a detective who looks at the situation with an unbiased viewpoint. That being said, the overarching plot could have worked in a couple of ways. One of them is making the Merry Men a constant presence in all or most of the cases. They could be helping or blackmailing the perpetrators for their plans, which Holmes has to thwart. For example, one of the cases has Montague Dunn, director of Kew Gardens, killed by his assistant Martin Hamish to take over his position with the help of Miss White who only does so to get herself out of poverty after, you know, she spent all her money on luxury goods. Though Holmes' primary concern was the theft of the plants by the Divine Syndicate, who claimed that Dunn borrowed them but never returned them. This case is ripe for the Merry Men's involvement. They could be helping Miss White, promising she will never have to depend on people like Dunn or Hamish again. They could even help the Divine Syndicate steal the plants, or use their poisonous properties against the upper class. It preserves the plot of the case while also making the Merry Men an actual threat. The alternative is making an individual Merry Men case. Sherlock could work with Mycroft and hunt the group down, turn the mentioning of the Oceanic and the murder of the banker's sons into an actual case, while preserving the plan to destroy the London Stock Exchange. The Oceanic. Isn't that the largest steamer ever built? Yes. And these two young banker chaps are sons of the owners of the White Star Line, the company that built it. They're the rumors of corruption. Both keep the game's overall structure intact 
and add more significance to the overarching plot. As it is, The Merry Men feels like a last minute idea, something crammed in to add depth. It's not a horrible idea, it sheds light on the realities of working class revolutions. But the cases themselves are already great on their own, and players might not remember that the Merry Men are supposed to be dangerous forces until the end. Still, Crimes and Punishments is a great game, and has a profound influence since later games and even other companies have used variations of its gameplay formula. I will see if playing through the other games in Frogwares' catalog changes my stance. Though, like I said in one of my videos, Crimes and Punishments would be my last foray into Frogwares Sherlock Holmes. At least for now. I will play and record them while prepping and releasing my following few videos, which I cannot wait to show. So, if you haven't yet, subscribe or follow the channel so you don't miss when I upload. Also, leave a like and share your opinions about the Merry Men story arc in the comments. Finally, thanks for watching, and for those who are new, welcome aboard. And here's a little preview of what's to come.